Welcome everyone to the Engineers Without Borders USA Latrine Assessments webinar. My name is Joshua Knight. I am a senior project engineer here at headquarters and we are going to go through this latrine assessments webinar to talk about how to go on a first technical assessment for latrines. I'd like to start off with our vision and mission because everything we do, webinars, guidelines, checklists, talk with chapters, all of this should go back to our vision and mission. First of all, we are looking to create projects for communities that are community driven and they are sustainable. And at the same time, we want to develop our members to be better engineers, more open to the world, um, more open to working on poverty. And so this latrine assessment hits that in that we are working to make your project a more sustainable project, a better latrine project for the community. So first we're going to talk about the background that you're going to need in order to work on a latrine project. And then we're going to talk a little bit more about how you move forward from your assessment into the design of your latrines. Okay, so we want to talk about this webinar, unlike other web, other technical webinars like water or structures, there's something that's, there's a cultural sensitivity here that we're going to have to address. Sanitation is a, a difficult topic to talk about. So we're going to go into that um, as well as looking at the different options that you have for rural sanitation, which is normal for other projects. We'll look at the known resources that we do have for it. We'll talk about what data collection needs you're going to have on this first assessment trip and we'll talk about some realistic costs that are that are uh, general but enough that you'll be able to talk to the community about that. Um, we'll talk when we get into cultural sensitivity we'll talk about this issue especially uh, with respect to women who may not be able to go to the bathroom because there may it may not be a safe place. Okay so we'll talk uh, we're, we've already spoken a little bit about introduction, we'll talk about background, um, why is this even something that you'll want to do uh, for your specific community. We'll talk about the assessment and design process for this latrine project. We'll look at some lessons learned and finally we'll finish up with some references. We're not going to be looking at any in-depth wastewater treatment plant design or detailed design or implementation guidelines. We're just looking at this first phase, the assessment phase. Okay, so why is sanitation important? Well, first of all, um, I want to thank you for looking at taking on a sanitation project. It's basically not looked at as uh, the, the, the best or the prettiest project to take, but it's, it's as you can see from this slide here that I'm not going to read, it's incredibly important, so thank you so much for taking on uh, this type of project. You can see here that, that uh, uh, sanitation affects uh, so many uh, people around the world that, uh, that if you can help solve this problem for one uh, project, it's going to be uh, much better for the community. And I just saw that it looks like the, the slides aren't advancing. Uh, to, you just see the same title slide. Okay, let me see. I'm going to have to start over the, start this over and make sure that you can all see it again. Okay, I'm going to ask, it, does everyone see the vision and mission slide now? No, you still don't see the vision and mission. Okay, well, let me try something again. Let me do this. I'm going to change screens, and then I'm going to change it back. Can people see vision and mission now? Yes, good.
Good. Okay, now I'm going to advance the slide. I'm going to check that you can see the next one. Can you see the goal of the webinar? Okay, good. So we're on the same page. Thank you all so much. And these were just introductory slides, and I'm glad you caught me before we move further. So uh, here were the learning objectives that we were talking about. Uh, we're looking at cultural sensitivity, uh, the different options you're going to have for your sanitation project, what resources you have, the data that needs to be collected, and then realistic costs. And to repeat again about our outline, we're going to do an intro, we're going to go into the background for latrines, we're going to look at the assessment and design process, follow up with some lessons learned and references. Uh, we're not going to be looking at a full in-depth wastewater treatment plant design, nor are we going to look at uh, detailed design and implementation guidelines. We're just sticking to the assessment stage. As far as sanitation, this is an incredibly important topic. The cost benefits for this, you're, you're saving them time, you're, you're reducing direct and indirect health costs, um, you're in you're increasing the return on investments for education. Uh, you're safeguarding water resources from, from being polluted by, um, uh, by black water. Uh, black water is what we call water that would come from a toilet. Uh, so that would include both excrement and uh, urine. We call that black water. Gray water is like water that you would receive from your kitchen sink. So we're taking care of black water with, uh, with this latrine project. Getting this right has a positive effect on economic growth in parts of Africa. Half of the hospital beds at any one time uh, are filled with people from that have diarrheal diseases. Um, this is such a high financial uh, burden that taking care of this, according to uh, the Global Poverty Project, can increase the economic growth of a community, and specifically those that they study in Sub-Saharan Africa by 3%, which is not incredible. It's realistic, but that's a really good thing you can do. Okay, so why is this important? Well, untreated sewage is nasty. Uh, it ha that's why we are so intrinsically, um, you know, afraid of it. We don't want to get near it. That's good. That's That helps us stay healthy. Uh, it has so many diseases in it, as listed here. It can also... Uh, cause fish mortality, eutrophication, which is like a deadening of a water body. That means that because um, because black water is basically sewage is a uh, fertilizer. And so it fertilizes the water and it grows lots of great algae on top. But that algae, it blocks the sunlight from the water. And then so there's no sun getting through. And then when it dies, it sucks out all the oxygen. So you don't have any water. Or, I mean, you don't have any sunlight. You don't have any oxygen. Everything in that water body is going to die. That's what eutrophication is. And also red tides, which are some of, uh, one of the types of algae that can be grown from uh, uh, untreated sewage. As uh, it's in and in itself is toxic to both uh, humans and marine organisms. So here's a quick look at diarrheal morbidity and how it is. Morbidity is like people getting sick. Diarrhea morbidity and reducing that through both sanitation and hygiene projects as well as hygiene promotion only projects. So this is one study done by the World Bank. It's not the only study. It's not the end all. You can see here they just look to try to find the best uh, diarrhea morbidity reductions that they could and, and all the studies they could find at that time this is 2006 so there's definitely been a lot more in you know in the past nine years but this is just to give you an understanding so water quality only you can see there they they found four studies and there was a 15 percent in uh, diarrhea uh, 15 percent reduction at water quantity only uh, has in the same ballpark about you know 20% rounded. And then water quality and quality, you can see there it actually went down. Um, so you know these are real studies because they're real places and every place isn't going to be exactly the same. So this actually makes sense. Uh, but it's still there in the, in the low 20s, about 20%. Look at sanitation, it jumps up to over 30%. That's a big deal. So that shows that you're doing great work. 
You put water and sanitation together, again, some reason, it decreases. But still, it's somewhere in the 30s. And then you do hygiene just by itself, and it's, it's in that 30%. That means you don't improve their water, you don't improve their sanitation. That is a key to show you you should absolutely be pushing hygiene promotion every single time you go down to your community, not just when you implement, but every, every I don't even say every time, every meeting you have with the community, you should have at least a few minutes dedicated to talking about uh, correct hygiene. And, and we'll go over that a little bit on, on, in, in a few slides here. So just one more uh, point here in that why sanitation is not looked at uh, by other folks uh, or uh, by other pro or project teams is that, you know, again, it's kind of a dirty thought, you know, oh, let's do a water project. It's clean. It's wonderful. Sanitation is thought of as dirty. Um, but as, as we've already seen, it's an incredibly important project. So thank you for taking it on. Here is one slide. This is the only slide I'm going to give on a hygiene promotion, or actually it's just um, the uh, uh, the transmittal route for fecal contamination, and uh, and this is really one of the most important types of slides you could give to your communities. So you can see here that um, you basically got a transmittal route from feces to a victim. Okay, feces on the left side, victim on the right side. And in the middle are the vectors, the way that it gets there. So it can get there through fluids, fingers, flies, and the fields or the floors. And then uh, you'll see here these barriers are these blue bars. And the different types of barriers come from different types of interventions. We've got three total. You've got sanitation there. You are breaking all but one of the barriers, or all of the one of the vectors for getting sick. Uh, in other words, people could still get excrement on their hand when using a clean sanitation facility and still potentially uh, victimize themselves or others uh, because uh, they didn't wash their hands. Uh, you can see here by clean water supply, you only break one root. You give people clean fluid, but their fingers, flies, and the fields are still could be potentially contaminated. So when you put those two together, then um, you still have not taken care of the finger because geekers can still choose not to wash their hands. But you can see you add in their hygiene, you've done it. You've done it. And you actually can hit all four uh, uh, vectors because people, even if they don't have clean water with hygiene, they know how to clean it. They can, they can boil it. Um, they know how to wash their hands. Um, they know how to get rid of flies. They, they know to cover things up to keep uh, flies out of their food. Uh, they know how to keep the field floors clean because they can do something like a cat hole instead of uh, uh, just uh, going to the bush and pooping on the ground. So hygiene is by far the most important thing. So make sure you include it in your project. Okay. Very quick slide. We're just going to run through here. You can see that uh, uh, these are the areas where we need sanitation. Sub-Saharan Africa, for sure, a little bit in South America and Asia. These are the places we work. We're in the right places. Uh, very quickly, I'll let you know that you're usually working in rural sanitation, which means you would have this the first or the second um, little diagram here where you'd be making either an open pit or a closed pit that would be cleaned out by someone else. We're not usually doing uh, these very complicated um, types of collection systems like you'd see in, uh, in urban areas. All right, a little bit about some concepts to understand. So treatment versus storage, uh, basically in the previous slide, you saw that you could have an open pit, in other words, that all the water leaks out, or you could have a closed pit uh, that people have to actually suction out, which is, which is the, the case in certain countries like India where, where you're a little bit closer together. Um, treatment versus storage, while you're storing your materials, there is going to be some treatment going on. Also the same with anaerobic versus aerobic. Uh, many of our systems are anaerobic in that they sit in the ground and they 
uh, do not have any oxygen is the definition of anaerobic. Anaerobic means with oxygen, that you are getting some oxygen in there. Usually the majority of our systems have both, uh, but you will have it mainly be one or the other, and that will be something you will decide as a project team. And also, I, we just want to caution you about uh, drinking water contamination because you are basically now concentrating this waste, okay? So you're getting rid of open defecation, which is, that's a nasty thing. It's good that you're getting rid of that, but at least it was dispersed. Now you're concentrating those ways. You better make sure to dispose of those correctly. If you don't dispose of those correctly, you are potentially contaminating their groundwater or surface water that they drink from. So it's very important that you do this project correctly. Um, as pointed out here, uh, sometimes excess percolation can happen. What is percolation? Percolation is the flow of groundwater through the soil. Okay, that's a simple term, or, or a simple definition, I should say. Excess percolation, you will have a definition of how fast your water is going to percolate through the soil. Sometimes it'll, it'll go faster than what you've calculated. You need, to, you need to understand that that could happen. Also, you could have a perfectly sound, sealed structure, but it could crack. And then there's going to be percolation where you didn't expect it. Same thing about upslope of wells. Basically, the groundwater underneath the surface usually flows in the same direction as the topography. If there's a hill, it's usually going to flow downhill, but that's not always correct. Sometimes when the topography above the surface is going uphill, there'll be uh, underground will be going slightly downhill. Uh, so you need to be, take these all into consideration when you're doing your latrine project. It's very important you do this correctly. You do not want to contaminate their water source. You will not be the heroes. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about what technologies you can use for latrines. We can first go with an improved pit latrine, which is just a hole in the ground with a, um, with a way to get rid of the odor. A poor flush latrine is one like we would have here in the West. Ecological sanitation or basically a compost in the toilet. And then where you have no latrine, you can go in a cat, you can dig a cat hole. Lastly, for all of these, you can make the variations that are, that are child friendly and that they don't fall in, um, uh, helping out the elderly and that you have maybe a railing or a raised toilet seat. And also you may have to have a raised pit where you have a high water table or there's rocky soil um, uh, where, where there's, or where there's really low infiltration, really high uh, clay type soils where, where you can't low filtration or low um, seepage from your pit. All right, so let's talk about all the three of these, or all four of these really a little bit uh, more in detail here. As you can see here, the ventilated pit latrine, it's basically just a pit. Um, you've got, a, I'm going to use my mouse here, you've got a um, You've got uh, the man sitting on the latrine. You can see the excrement will go down. And along with that, these blue arrows are airflow. So this is the only addition. It's a pit like you'd see in many countries, but this air is flowing in through the bottom, through the top, hopefully both ways. You want a lot of airflow in these types of latrines. It's going down this pit, and then it's going to go up, and it's going to go out uh, this one addition to a normal pit is this uh, ventilated pipe. And this pipe is what carries both the air out of the latrine, so there's no odors, as well as the flies. And the flies come up here and they get stuck on this fly screen right here. Why did they get stuck? Why did they even fly up there? Well, the reason is, as you can see here, your latrine needs to be kind of dark. It, you do not want a lot of light here like in Western type latrines. The reason for that is that flies go towards the light. Now they will be attracted to the excrement smell, so they're going to come in through the bottom and the top of this latrine. They'll go down into the excrement. When they fly out though, they're not going to know where to go, so they're going to see the light. So this has to be a straight pipe going straight to the sun, and they're going to try to fly out there. They're going to get stuck on this fly stream, they're going to fall back down, and they're going to die in the pit, and they are not coming out. That's the important key here. They are not getting out of this latrine because flies are the ones, one of those vectors that we want to stop. Um, and that's how you will do it with this 
uh, project with this type of latrine. All right, so the advantages are, of course, it's very cheap. You're just adding a uh, pipe. They're very simple, very easy to make, very easy to maintain, uh, and you don't need any water source. Okay, so the problem is once it does fill up, you're going to have to move your slab, which uh, you'll need to be thinking about as you design it. We'll want to be able to move this slab because they're very expensive. And so uh, teams have made them round so that you can roll them to the next spot. Teams have made them in uh, uh, more than one section so that they can move it. And they put uh, bars on it that they'll be able to move it with. And then also it may indicate lower, lower social status because it's what they already had. So what's the big deal here? Except it's good. Um, and it's good that it can stop odors if you maintain them correctly. If you don't, you're going to have the same problems you had before. All right, let's look at the next one, poor flush latrine. As you can see here, there's really nothing extremely special. Again, we've got... Uh, a normal house with a pit. In this case, it doesn't have a commode on top. So either way, you can you can do either uh, the actual uh, appurtenance, uh, the toilet can can be here or it can be different. But basically, the key here to this one is that you have this YouTube, and this YouTube is going to some pit that's a little bit further off. It has to be offset a little bit because you have this YouTube. And this water seal pan here is something that you have here in the West in your own toilet. This is a this is a odor seal. This water keeps any of these odors from coming up. It also keeps any of the flies from flying down. It's such a great invention, and it's so simple. Um, so this is one of the great things about uh, uh, having a poor flush latrine. Now, poor flush doesn't mean you're you're pouring tons of water down here. It could be just a liter uh, or two just to be able to get this down here and you can actually build your system to use more or less water um, based on what you have available. All right, so this odor trap as I spoke of uh, makes really a very low need for maintenance. A, a cup of water poured in there if it ever does start to smell and really it shouldn't be flowing in there. If, if there's if you smell something, that means the water has evaporated. That means people aren't using their latrine. So if something's going on there you need to check out. Also, it's kind of a higher social status. People are thought of as having this Western lifestyle, so that's easy. Difficulty is you've got to find that water somewhere. It doesn't mean you have um, always flowing water, but usually you want to have uh, easily accessible water nearby. Uh, it's definitely going to be more expensive than just a pit latrine. And, uh, and still, you're going to have to move that slab once it's filled up. All right, the last one here is compost and latrine. As you can see, here's a couple options, uh, different looks at it. Um, what you can see here is basically it's off the ground. So these are uh, good for where you have a high water table. And you have two sides. Both of these have two sides. And the reason for that is you're going to fill up one side on the left. And when that's full, you're going to move a uh, uh, a appurtenance for actually using the the restroom over to the other side here and this one which is currently like a mixing stick here uh, you'd move that back to this side um, and and you can have different takes on this this doesn't have to be what you do you can see here it's very good that you have sunlight to help the composting process occur you've got some vent pipes here uh, they're also painted black to help get some airflow through here um, but this is the basics. And on this side, you have like where the urine goes. If you have urine diversion, urine in this case is going straight to vegetation. That doesn't have to be your site. This is just one of a couple examples, of several examples. And here's another take on that. It's called EcoSan Fossa Alternative. And that's where you basically only have a slab and a pit. And uh, what you can see here is in year one, you're basically filling up the pit. Uh, with your slab, you, on year two, you've moved the slab to the other side, uh, to another pit. You start filling that one up. At the, sec at the same time, you've filled up, you've covered your first pit with some dirt, and you let that sit for a year. By the third year, that first pit, you can now remove it, and this second, side, second pit is now filled up, so you move that slab back to the first pit, start over again there. And then you can cover up the second pit and let that sit rest for a year and finish composting. So concerns here is that, uh, well, as you're digging out that hole, 
maybe it's going to fall in you and in on you. And nobody wants to dig out poop, especially nobody wants to dig out poop when it's going to fall on them and kill them. So, you know, some concern here, you can line those pits or you can make sure you have very strong soil like clay that's not going to uh, uh, fall in on you. Or you can just not even deal with digging out that pit and you can just plant a tree there. So that's the options there. Okay, so advantages, no need for any water. It's actually, you don't want any water. You want to keep the water out. So either you can have a urine diversion or you can have like a grate at the bottom of your compost on the train to get rid of that uh, urine and bring it to a, a garden or something else as, as we pointed out there in that first diagram. Also, it's kind of indicative of Western status. Uh, and it's actually leapfrogging many of us here in the West who, who don't have any of that kind of thing where you actually use um, the uh, excrement that turns into composting. Uh, when it fills up, you just keep going. You don't need to move any slabs. And uh, these not just provide fertilizer, it also provides compost and pesticide. Uh, so these are, these are very uh, useful types of latrines to have. The bad part is they can be very expensive and they can be odorous if they're not used correctly. And it's very difficult to get communities to use these correctly. Uh, it takes a lot of education and uh, they're very complex. So this is something we actually usually encourage chapters to shy away from unless they're really willing to educate their community thoroughly on this. All right, cat holes, when you don't even have a latrine, what you should be doing in the bush. Uh, you usually dig these about 15 centimeters or, or six inches, which is about the height of this little spade here. Uh, so that's kind of a good measurement. Uh, usually they're they're pro improperly made. You know, people don't dig them deep enough. Uh, they don't properly uh, cover them. Uh, it's good to actually mix them, uh, mix the soil, the excrement with a stick, cover it with a bout of leaves and soil, and even put that stick right straight into the mound so people know that, oh, what's this funny stick doing there? Maybe that's someone's cat hole. I shouldn't walk on that. Okay, so just a mention here of something that's new for us. This is not new for China and much of Asia. It's called a biodigester. These are really exciting because they actually convert this excrement and urine straight into something called biogas that is uh, immediately useful for a community to use. Now, um, just a note, it's in China there are literally millions of these currently operating, over 25 million operating in China alone. Uh, so this stuff is obviously not, uh, you know, new, uh, but in our side of the world it is. Now, as pointed out here below, you do need not just one family to make these work. You usually need, uh, you know, some animals as well uh, to get enough of this uh, excrement going that you can make this biodigester work. Uh, in order to get you some uh, some gas. That's the thing that comes out of this, is that you get natural gas and you can actually cook on it and you can light uh, uh, a, uh, uh, a lantern with it. So you get two wonderful things. It's not a lot, but it's free and it works very well. Okay, so um, some advantages, uh, source of cooking and lighting. Uh, you get rid of that animal, that human waste, you get uh, better water quality you have no need for wood or charcoal. So it works great in places where you don't have a lot of wood or if it's expensive. Uh, and that, that fossil fuel is utilized, is uh, saved. Uh, it's also better for the environment, for climate change, because that CO2 already existed. Uh, let's see, it's quicker, uh, easier to cook with. You just turn it on and light a match. Um, excellent compost that comes out from this. Uh, and uh, it's already ready to use on the farm. Uh, you know, you're having less trees cut down. Alternatives to biochesters um, can, can have a worse impact on the environment we spoke about. And, uh, and yeah, the impact on climate change. Okay, so other advantages, leading cause of death is uh, respiratory illness. And so, you know, you're going to have a lot less smoke that comes from these. And um, and also, it's just it's it's something that people can't afford. But when you can make it for free, obviously, it's it's going to be it's going to be a great resource. Disadvantages, of course, you're going to have this. It doesn't really work so well in cold climates. 
uh, because the, the bugs that break it down just don't work so fast and it takes too long. Uh, it does use more water uh, than a straight composting toilet. Uh, so, you know, some places there's going to be aversion to handling these bees actually in almost all cultures. So you have to overcome that with this or with a uh, eco eco latrine as well, the compost and latrine. And if you don't construct it well, there's not there, you're going to lose some of that gas or all of the gas. Uh, so you need to make sure to be doing this correctly. So you really need to make sure on your first one you do it right, because otherwise people are going to really poo-poo your type of project. Um, and also there's some other innovative biodigesters that we just would frown upon that, you know, really, these have been tried and true in China for millions and millions. It's probably best we go with something like that, um, that uh, to make sure that we get this done right. Um, and also, you know, it's, it can be complicated for us in the West who haven't looked at it. Uh, it's going to take a while for that biogas to be generated, uh, and you're going to have more maintenance um, than, the, uh, than, than a normal septic tank, uh, as pointed out here. Okay, so now let's just compare those main three there, the VIP, uh, that's ventilated improved pit, uh, poor flush, and then a take on that is a poor flush twin pit, which is a little bit between poor flush and composting. Um, again, that adds the possibility that you'd be able to not have to move that slab all the time, so that's pretty important there. You can see that the um, uh, complexity and cost kind of go together. As you get more complex, you're going to get a little more um, costly. Um, all of these can be odor-free, to point out. All of these can be a barrier to those flies um, and, uh, and, and to, to creating bad uh, contaminated water. So you, any of these can, can really work for your, for your system. Okay, so let's go through this very quickly. Um, this is just the project process that we go through. Uh, we have a whole nother webinar that goes over this project process. So I'm just going to point out that, uh, that this project process that we go through follows a professional engineering design process. So you go from assessment to design to implementation to monitoring. And that's what ours does. We want to be as professional as possible. We want your project to be successful. And so that's why we follow this design process. Okay, so the first two we're going we're gonna to concentrate on because that's the stage that you're at with taking this webinar. First of all, you're going to assess, uh, and so you'll do that with a 521 report. And then after you're done assessing, you're going to come back and you'll send in a 522 report, which is going to tell us what you assessed and what were the uh, turnouts from, from what you did there, what you assessed. Um, the few things that we'll want you to do, you'll have to do, you'll have to do some observations, both technical and non-technical. You really want to find out what the community wants there. What are their priorities? What are their preferences? You want to find out, um, you know, you want to be able to provide them with sanitation options, not recommendations. You want to let them know these are everything that's, that's possible from us as, as, as your consultants. You are our client. These are the options. They will all work. You find out the one that's going to work best for you. Uh, and also, you really need to establish that in-country partner. That is critical to having a successful project. And then, uh, uh, just to repeat, at that 522 stage, which is just a post-assessment report, you tell us what happened. Okay, so now let's talk a little bit about what you're going to need to collect on your trip. We're going to go through all 10 of these uh, in more depth, so I'm going to first go through them quickly. You want to find out the community preference, the population currently, and how it's going to grow. Percolation rate, which is what we spoke about, how water flows through the soil. You want to find out pit sizing, how big of a pit you want to make. You want to find out what the water situation is in the community. You want to analyze what kind of foundation you're going to need. You're going to want to look at the piping capacities for your project. Uh, the appurtenances, the equipment, like the toilet itself, those kind of things, you're going to want to do a site plan analysis for at least 10 sites, I would say, for your pilot project, even though we're going to want you to only implement on one to three of those sites for your first trip. And I'll tell you why I want you to do 10, but you want to do an actual site plan analysis 
talk to your mentor, your technical lead about this. This means actual surveying of the entire site of that uh, receiving family. And also we'll talk a little bit about metrics, although that again is a different presentation. Let's talk about the community preference. You need to understand their own incentives for improved sanitation. There's a reason why they ask you to take on this project. Um, and this is something difficult to talk about. Perhaps work with your NGO to find about gender-specific breakouts that would work, work best, community surveys, maybe focus groups, uh, maybe going to individual houses. Uh, think about you know using very good translators rather than, especially if it's Spanish, you just kind of holding your own there. It's good to have the best local translators. Um, so you want to talk about what's their satisfaction of the, of the existing defecation practice and why do they want to improve that? Privacy, social status, avoiding snakes, other things, security. All right, community involvement takes time, especially on these types of projects because you're talking about something that's nasty. People don't want to talk about where they poop, how they poop, when they poop, but you're going to have to be able to do those things with them. So it takes time. Uh, to do that, um, you know, maybe doing, uh, respecting their culture, finding out what behaviors they do have that are good and trying to uh, reinforce those. Talk to the leaders, teachers, community leaders, media, spread the message about your project. Uh, find out about best how you can get the community to participate in the options and design. Slow down, worry about trust from the community. And also the monetary contribution is absolutely critical and required for all of our projects. 5% minimum, I usually start with 10%, not because I want to suck more money out of these poor communities, but the more money that the community contributes, the more ownership they're going to have. And the more they're going to care how much it costs because they're paying uh, out of their own pockets for this. Okay, total sanitation is something that we look at. We talked a little bit about adding the hygiene to your sanitation project and even adding water or at least looking down the road to how their water source is working. So really you want to look at wash as they say, water, sanitation, hygiene. Look at all those together. All right, so let's talk a little bit more about population. You want to know the current population, of course, but you want to think about how it's growing. You can find that the World Health Organization could give that country stats, just do an estimate based on your community surveys. Next, let's look at the percolation rate the rate at which water moves through the soil. We want you to use three methods and use them all to estimate the percolation. Related observation, find out what latrines currently exist, find out their age, their dimensions, approximate amount full, and actually get an S directly from that. Uh, that's one of the best ways that people often overlook literature view. As you can see here, I'm listing some literature numbers uh, that you could use, uh, but you should look this up on your own and find out which best uh, work for you. Uh, again, that latrine plus gray water, so it's basically black plus gray water is 40 liters per capita per year is what that LPCY stands for. And if it's just the latrine, just black water, you can look at liters per capita per year, 25. So that could be the S. S is the sludge accumulation rate. Lastly, we want you to calculate that through some hole digging. Dig a hole, best to dig it the depth of the future latrine, which is at least one meter, uh, perhaps two, perhaps even deeper. Uh, you can dig it where people think they want to have their latrine, and then they already have it dug. Of course, they'll have to cover that up after you leave. Um, but multiple holes, because usually you have more than one different type of soil. You usually have one that's uh, more rocky, which will be very difficult to dig, and then you'll have one that's uh, more uh, loam or, or sandy that's, that's easier to dig. So try to look for different sites that represent the totality of, of the area that you're in. Uh, you have to give us a standard operating procedure for that, uh, uh, for that calculation, and here's one right here for you to take. And by the way, I will send these slides out to everyone that's on the call so you can have these uh, and utilize this. All right, pit sizing. This is a calculation that uh, that is I'm going to go through quickly that uh, is basically how big do you want your pit? And that's just B, storage capacity. And it's using that S value that we found in the previous slide. But again, you'll, you'll be able to get all this as you move down. 
P is the number of people using that latrine, N is the number of years between when you want that thing to be full or you want someone to be able to pump it out. And F is a factor very close to one that we'll explain on the next slide. And S is that sludge rate that you found from the previous uh, slide. And this B, this is just an example calculation that 750 liters would be uh, from, you know, six capacity C is um, uh, the, the uh, people using this um, latrine and they want it to last for five years. F is usually one or very close to that. And S is the 25 liters per capita per year that we spoke of that's literature value, which would give you 750 liters that you need for this particular latrine. This F factor, uh, really very basic slide. I'm not going to spend time on this. Basically, you can see here that depending on how many years between desludging and the temperature that you have in the region, you're going to have a different, a, a very close number to one, but you can see it can, it can vary a little bit. Okay, so uh, we still need to get through the rest of the things that you need to look for in your latrine project. Water assessment, you need to find out is water available? Uh, what kind is it? Is it for each family? Is it community? Community taps? Uh, foundation analysis, you want to look at uh, the soil that you've got there. So you're thinking you're dealing with a tree, you don't have to deal with soil. You do. You need to find out what type of soil you have to make sure that you have the correct soil foundation there. Maybe you're going to need to uh, do some extra structural um, stability for that soil. And uh, maybe you have to align your pit. You, you know, these are the kind of things you find out by doing a foundation analysis, looking at the soil that you have there. And we have standard operating procedures. We have a whole other webinar that looks at that. Piping capacity, hydraulic analysis. Is the poop going to go down? Make sure it does. Uh, equipment and appurtenance selection, community preferences. Please don't think and please don't let them think that Western toilets are the best way to go. You know, squat plates have been to show, uh, be shown to be much better on the prostrate uh, than Western toilets. So don't assume Western is best. Uh, maybe all of us should be squatting and be much better for our prostate. People will be getting less, much prostate cancer. Um, then site plan analysis. I told you, you should look at all potential clients um, uh, as far as, uh, um, you know, I would like for you to look at 10. Usually we say you only are approved for one to three, maybe five, but it's best to keep it to three families you do your first implementation on. Um, but we want you to really review 10 uh, because they're going to be required to do a five to 10% cash contribution. And what you should say to the community is just let them choose the 10 and even the priority of the 10. You're going to go do a uh, site plan analysis of all 10 on this assessment trip. But you tell them right up front, you are not getting this latrine. Only one latrine is coming, maybe three, but only one is coming out of these 10. You guys decide the priority, but don't think that just because we're doing a site plan analysis, you're getting a latrine. So be very forward about that. Uh, and someone just asked a question. They'd like uh, the standard operating procedures for uh, doing the foundation analysis, and that's basically doing a soil analysis. And uh, let's see if it was on that slide. Um, no, I don't think it was. So uh, I can write anyone. If you have a question about that, I can give you more information about that. But we do have another webinar that's just on uh, soil foundation. But it's in its, it, it hasn't been made finalized yet. Uh, it's still in its draft stages. But I, I can send out the draft version to anyone who requests it. So um, let's see, we talked about site plan analysis. Last one is metrics. Again, I'm not going to spend time on this because we have another webinar on uh, PMEL, which is planning, monitoring, evaluation, and learning. But uh, these are the types of metrics that you'd want to look at, impact-oriented, measurable, time limit, specific, and practical. And then the next slide is a few of those. Uh, these are the types of things you can look at. No open defecation would be a great goal to get to. Uh, no feces inside your 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 uh, latrine. It's being replaced when it's fully uh, when full and cleaned as needed. No family without a toilet. Reduction in waterborne disease uh, and sustainability indicators. 
hand washing, people know when to do it, people have soap nearby. Um, additional factors that you should be looking at on your assessment. Survey the land, we talked about this. You need to be thinking about uh, gravity site layout um, of each of your, of the whole community and of the individual homes. You need to be looking up local codes, local laws, because you are required to follow local, con local laws and codes in your community. You want to visit hardware stores. You want to be getting even a pro forma invoice that you can hand them. A pro forma invoice is saying, here's the approximate type and number of, of uh, pit equipment that we're going to need for our latrine project. And getting an estimate, we, it's best to get at least three uh, 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 invoices filled out from different hardware stores so you have a good feel for what's the best. Uh, you want to look at the t uh, soil type that we spoke of. These are the different types of tests that you can do. Again, I can send that out to anyone who's requesting it. Just send me an email. It's at the end of our uh, presentation. And uh, other types of systems currently operating surrounding communities, find out what they do and, and see if you can improve upon it. Find out what you don't need to improve on. Uh, survey everyone. Find out what they think about this and get photographs, many, many photographs of existing latrines, even inside existing latrines. Uh, end of the, latrine, of, of the terrain around it, of every home that you want to go to from all different angles. Okay. Uh, education, we talked about this one. The fecal oral root was that first uh, slide on education I told you about that goes from the left to the right and the four vectors. You're going to talk about that. Um, you know, this is a significant health impact. You want to train not just people that are going to, that it's going to stop at. You want to train the trainers, which can mean children. They'll teach it to their families, but also teachers, of course. A uh, couple training with monitoring and surveys, meaning you're going to houses and finding out what kind of uh, latrine problems are there. Are they all dirty? Are there flies all over? Uh, you know, look at look at other hygiene practices. Do, do they cover their water that they drink from? Do they have a cup with a handle on it? Very simple things. Uh, and you, you can give them on-the-spot advice that's going to be very helpful for that family. And then you can take it back to your meeting, which every meeting you should be doing this. You can talk about some general uh, things that you saw in the community that you'd like for them to improve and things that you saw that went well. Uh, talk about operation, maintenance, repairs, and owner-initiated construction of latrines. That should definitely be happening. Okay, just a few points um, before we uh, follow up with some lessons learned. Uh, this is just to point out you really need sun and you really need to plan your project. Don't just expect it to happen or it will go much, much slower than you hope. Uh, materials are very important. Uh, it's good to get them very nicely cleaned here. Uh, you can see you're getting it in this dump truck and they are a good quality, but you can see that we're still washing them afterwards. And also you can get that material locally. Uh, but again, you, it may be not as high quality. Maybe it's much rounder rocks that aren't so good for concrete. Um, but uh, but that but they're available and that's what people are going to use after you left. So maybe you should use that in the first place. Also, as far as labor goes, they should be doing as well as the cash contributions. Uh, your community should be digging all their pits. If they can't dig the pit, they should be paying someone to do it. If they don't, if they don't have the money to do it, that should be the community paying someone else to do it or volunteering someone. That should not be your problem. The pit should all be dug for you, uh, as well as cleaning of the gravel, as you saw in the previous slide. Uh, here's a very important thing. Managing client expectations, they should receive 10% or I mean they should be paying 10% of the baseline latrine. If you want more, you should pay 100% of the extra. In other words, concrete structure versus a wood structure, a raised pit. Um, in, in this example, this young man received both. He got a raised pit, he got a concrete superstructure instead of wood and just a normal squat. He paid for 100% of those extras. That really should be what we do. You know, if people have enough money, they want a super nice latrine, fine. They should pay 100% of those extra things because you want to keep it fair. Um, you know, if they can subsidize a little bit extra, they should subsidize 100% of it. All right. Um, lessons learned from teaching to facilitating. You don't just feel like you're teaching them and they know nothing. Don't think you're subsidizing the poor. These communities can do it on their own. You are assisting them. They are your clients. Um, 
you 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 must persuade them no 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 you don't need to persuade them you don't need to motivate them let them decide tell them all the best options all of them all three of the options we talked about vip poor flesh composting biodigester all those are good let them decide which one's best bigger budgets to lower budgets don't be spending lots of money on each latrine they should be able to do this on their own uh, after you leave. And if you're making $1,000 latrines, there's no way anybody's going to be able to follow suit on that. They should be more like 100 or 80 like we spoke of in those slides. Lessons learned. Here's more lessons learned. There's so many to go through here. Um, you got to look at all options. And, and when you're reviewed by the Technical Advisory Committee, they're going to expect that you've gone through all these options. So make sure you review them all. Um, thorough measurements on that assessment trip. You're going to want to make sure that you understand um, everything that's going on there so that you can make good decisions for the community. Supply and demand. Supply is that uh, is the latrine uh, excrement and water that's going, or urine that's going into the latrine, the, or I'm sorry, the supply is the size of the pit. The demand is the excrement and urine that's going into it. So you need to understand that very well. Remember seasonality. Remember water tables are incredibly important. If you're there in the dry season, you may not realize how close the water table comes in the rainy season. And you do not want the latrine to be under a water table because then you're contaminating their groundwater. Um, consider land ownership up front with the community. You should probably see some deeds. Um, that would be the best, obviously, that the family that wants their latrine can show you a deed that they own the land that they want their latrine on. Um, it's just easier. There's there's options. People run out the day that you are digging, trying to dig your latrine pit, and say, "No, that's my land," and not that you're going to pay them the three thousand dollars for the for the pit or whatever they want. But it's going to kill one week, two weeks, and you're not going to be able to finish your project. Okay, um, project agreements. This you know, don't make them real legalese. Um, make them in all the languages that uh, that the community knows and understands. Don't just make them in English. Don't even just make them in Spanish and English. Uh, make them in Quechua. Make them in all the languages that the people are get, that the people speak. Even video recorded for people who maybe can't uh, read, so that they can see that they agreed to everything that you spoke of in the video. Um, and just to get rid of any you know uh, debates down the road. Technical abilities of the community, you know, look at this. This is incredibly important. The more you can use them, the better. Let's see. Uh, community involvement, we talked about that. Get them involved from the very beginning, not just with cash, but even the assessment. Let them do anything they can do. Don't be thinking, oh, we'll get it done quick if we can just get this through. You know, think about training the community. Think about involving them from the very first time you step into the community. All materials must be local. You can't bring anything from the U.S. All right. Um, eyes on the ground. Uh, having a great involved NGO is critical to your project success. Uh, look at technology as well as behavioral aspects because if they're, if they're not going to uh, do some aspect of your, let's say, compost and latrines, they have to add some form of carbon like uh, – corn husks and they're not doing it and they're not going to do it, then maybe you need to rethink if you make a compost in the drain. Uh, lines of communication are so important for any project. Um, if you can speak the local language, that's very important on top of having local translators from the area. Um, get them involved very quickly. Uh, have lots of different mentors, not just one. Um, return to the site for a long time. Don't just think that five years is enough, and that's what we're requiring you, but even more, some of our best teams have stayed for 10. Reasonable construction schedules um, with contingencies are really important. Um, slow is best. Community-led construction activities. Um, here we've got references that I'll be sending out to all of you uh, along with this full slide deck so that you can know where to go through to for more information. And then here's the people who put together a presentation, uh, myself, Joshua Knight, as well as three members who are just volunteers who helped me put this together, and here's their current um, contact information. And that is all I had, and so now I'm going to
stop the recording and I will be able to take questions from everyone. Thank you all so much for listening. Let me know if you need any slides. I can forward those to you.